Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by certified fitness professional trainer, John Petrelli. For nearly 30 years, John has used his unique style of motivation as well as his program of physical exercise, nutrition, and martial arts training to positively impact the lives of people such as Grammy Award-winning recording artists, film celebrities, corporate executives, world-class athletes, as well as busy moms and dads alike. So we're going to be talking to John about his story and all that he's doing to positively impact the world and make it a better place. John, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, Curtis. Thank you for having me, and I'm excited to do this podcast. Thank you so much. Well, we're excited to have you. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. You know, in addition to what you had just eloquently reiterated, I've been a fitness trainer for 30 years. I have been, well, let's start all the way in the beginning. Grew up in a very small farm town to immigrant parents that came from Italy. I'm first generation Italian American. And from that small town, at some point, I, I went ahead and moved to California in my 20s and I became a fitness trainer because my passion really has been the human body performance finding out about myself, figuring out how to help people, figuring out how to help myself. And along the way, I fell into helping different people that were in the entertainment industry, that were athletes that, you know, over 30 years, it's been thousands and thousands of hours of working with all different people and learning more and more about how the human body works, more and more about how the human mind works and trying to melt those things together to get people where they want to go. Well, you got your start. So kind of kind of tell us how you, you actually got your start, because I saw in your bio that you were arrested as a youth, but you went from that, turned everything around, and now you're one of the top fitness experts in the nation. So explain that to the listeners. Sure. So, Curtis, I'll go all the way back because I think this can be of service to someone who may be, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old and trying to find their way or even younger. So I started off. And I wasn't by any means the most fit kid or I was a very late bloomer. I was four foot 11 as a freshman in high school. And I have a wonderful mom who's loved me dearly and showed her love and affection in many ways that are traditional ways of being caring. My dad grew up in a different era. He was a little bit older. He was born in 1921 and he lived through the depression. And in addition, he served in three wars. He was in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So my father had the tools that he had that were given to him by the military to be a parent, and he didn't have a father. So I don't begrudge my father for that. He was only given the tools he had and learned as he did and had his own journey and experience. But the way that translated to our relationship was more of he was a general and I was private first class, and there wasn't a lot of love and affection. And the dynamics we had made it so my life initially was filled with a lot of fear, fear of my father. We didn't have the best communication. And then that fear at one point turned to anger, anger and frustration. And so in my youth, that anger and frustration then turned into violence. And unfortunately for me and for other people that were involved, that violence spilled out into the streets and I got into many altercations. And the one that kind of put the brakes on my life is at, that was about 18 years old. I was getting ready to go to college. Uh, I didn't have a great future in college. I basically was going to one community college that would accept me. And I had a fight. And in that fight, I almost killed somebody. And I also had an altercation with a police officer. And all this happened in a split second and changed my life. And through that, my life was changed Thank God that the person I was in altercation with ended up living and that police officer and I was okay, but I worked my way through the legal system and I had a hard stop there that changed my life and made me know that I wanted to go into a different direction. I wanted to go and serve people. 
I wanted to think outside of myself of being selfish. And I wanted to see how I could be of service to people. And that was my leap into changing my mentality, which then changed my physicality. And I changed even my geography, had to remove myself from my peer group. Now, I don't blame my peer group at all. It's, I take full responsibility for everything I've done in my life. But I had to. I didn't have the whereabouts as a young man at 18 or 19 years old and the self-control to be with my peer group where I love dearly and not act out negatively. So I picked up with everything I had, which was a couple hundred dollars, and I moved from upstate New York to Southern California, where I pursued and started to pursue my dream of just being a good human being, number one. And a friend of mine had a, a place that he had no room in, and I slept on his floor, and I started my journey of changing my life and also becoming a fitness trainer. Well, through all that you've been through and um, that you've accomplished and trying to, like you say, change your life and become a better human being, you were also paralyzed by a rare autoimmune disease. So tell us about that and, and what that autoimmune disease was and how you bounced back from that. Sure, Curtis. So if in between me becoming a trainer at 20, 21 years old, and I'm 50, I'm going to be 51 right now. I'm an old guy now, Curtis. When you get to be my age, you'll see how it feels. But there's a lot of years in between. So I became this trainer and I started working with people. And I found that as I started serving people, as I started helping people, as I started seeing how I was being as service to them, that my life was changing. And I was healing inside as much as the people were transforming outside. So I thought in reality I was helping them. But in reality, they were helping me just as much. So my life has been defined by my physicality. I've been very physical. I'm in the martial arts. I am a brown belt in jujitsu. I've been in the martial arts since I was a kid. I got my first black belt at 18. I was in competitive bodybuilding. So here you have someone that has been defined by their physicality by helping people change their physicality. And in 2021, I came down with COVID. And my whole family came down with COVID. And for my two sons, I have two boys that are eight and 11. It was nothing more than a mere cold, a mere sniffle. It was no problem at all. And my wife contracted it after. And it was maybe slightly more symptoms for her. For her. But I ended up, I have a very type A personality. And when the, I had to quarantine, when I tested positive for COVID, it was very difficult for me to rest and take the amount of time I needed to recover. And I immediately started working out. I started training because I was quarantined and I couldn't sit still. And unfortunately, my bout with COVID ended up being much worse than it should have been. And I, uh, I suffered some, some tough COVID times. After COVID had passed, I started getting symptoms that were very odd, but I didn't say anything to anybody, Curtis. I didn't, sometimes as men, we keep things inside for right or for wrong. We don't make, we maybe not express ourselves as we should. And my feet started going numb. But I, once I was cleared for work, I was continuing to go to work. I didn't say anything to anybody. And then from my feet going numb, my hands started going numb. But every day I was showing up for work, going to do work 10, 12 hour days. And then from, from there, my symptoms progressed. And before long, I wasn't able to urinate. I wasn't able to go pee. But I really didn't say anything to anybody. I would spend like 10 minutes in the bathroom just trying to pee and relieve my bladder. And it was a, a painful thing. Well, when I finally broke down and told my wife, well, she actually found out because my hands and my feet were throbbing so much at night that I couldn't sleep, that I started taking ice baths. I started filling up the bathtub with ice and cold water. And it was the only thing that would relieve the pain from my feet and hands. And so my wife found out about that. And she insisted that I go to see a doctor. And that day, I actually told her, which is crazy. I told her, I said, once I get back from work, we can go to urgent care. She made me cancel work. And we went to urgent care. And once I was in urgent care, they started doing some tests. And we were blessed to have some great doctors who, after a few tests, thought that it was very possible that I had a thing called Guillain-Barre syndrome, an autoimmune disorder. And they asked that I go and take myself to the, the emergency room. Once we were in the emergency room, they did a spinal tap, which is they 
they took fluid from my spine and it came back positive that I was uh, had Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. I don't know. Are you familiar at all with GBS, Curtis? Yes, I am. Well, I'm not that familiar with it, but I know that uh, if you have it, you know, you can't take uh, certain vaccines and stuff like that. So I'm familiar with it somewhat. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. And it, one of the main things that happened to me is GBS starts attacking the myelin on your nerves, which is the sheath that goes around your nerves and it starts eating away at that. So my body's own autoimmune system thought there was a foreign invader and was attacking my nerve endings. So within a matter of 24 hours, when I got diagnosed, they brought me to the ICU and they put me in isolation. And I started getting so weak so rapidly that I could no longer hold my head up or shake the doctor's hand. I started losing all motor skills. I lost my ability to swallow food. So here I am with 30 plus years of training and being defined by my physicality. And the next thing you know, I'm in the ICU paralyzed, can only move my eyeballs and lost all my physicality. And I had to use my mentality to find a way out of there. Well, how did you regain your physicality after uh, GBS? Great question. So I was laying in a hospital and they they were running still a, a bunch of tests. The GBS, the way it the way it acts on the human body is ascended it went up from my feet to my knees. Then from my knees, it started ascending up my thighs to my waistline. And if it ascends to your heart and lungs, it can shut your heart and lungs down and it'll have to put you on an, a respirator to keep you alive. So they put me on a medication called IVIG. It's immunoglobin. And that is supposed to calm your system down from attacking your nerves. Well, I was in the ICU for a course of 10 days. And over that 10 days, I made an absolute decision, number one, to never complain about anything. I knew that although I had lost all my physicality, that there was somebody potentially in the next room that was not going to make it out of the ICU. So I felt that this was happening not to me, but for me, and that there would be some lesson learned from this experience. I, I'm going to name drop here for just a second, but one of my clients is Bob Marley's first son, who I've trained for 20 years. His name is Ziggy Marley. And I love Bob Marley music. I love reggae. I love the positive vibrations. I love Ziggy's music. So I started filling my room with the sounds of positive vibrations and playing reggae. My wife, my dear wife, who has really been a key part of my recovery, started making me pureed foods, organic pureed foods, because I couldn't swallow. And the selection at the ICU was not the greatest, which is a whole other thing we could talk about, about how food in hospitals are not necessarily the most nourishing. So she was bringing me pureed soups every day of organic vegetables. So I had nutrition, I had positive vibrations and music, and then I had my mentality, which was, I actually, I'm very, I'm a man of faith, uh, for me, I believe in God and I started praying and I started praying to number one, keep my mind occupied and number two, to have positive thoughts in my head and not allow any negative th thoughts to come in my head. So I started praying to my body and asking it to calm down. So my own nerve endings would start healing and my own body would stop attacking those nerve endings. And that combination of things, I mean, there's a lot that went in those 10 days of being paralyzed, but with that combination of nourishing foods, positive thoughts in my head, positive vibrations and music, support from my amazing doctors, my amazing family, I was able to eventually wheelchair it out of the hospital and head home. And then from that wheelchair, I had to go to therapy. I went five days a week, plus I did another, another two days a week on my own. So I did seven days a week for three months. And I progressed from a wheelchair to a walker, to a cane, to being functional again and helping people and working. And I did it in a speed that my doctors thought were probably thought I was crazy, but I, we only have one life and I want to live this life to its fullest and I want to do all I can. And so... I thought it was best that I expedite my my recovery if all possible. Amazing. Yeah, go go ahead and talk about the hospital and the food, how, how they're not 
as nourishing as people think they are. Yeah. So I'll even go back further. My son, who is now eight, my youngest son, um, had a very rare also staph infection when he was about two or three years old. And he spent five days in ICU. And we were sleeping there every day with him because he was young. He couldn't communicate, didn't have great verbal skills yet. He's our son. We're going to stay there and watch over him. And my wife and I would take turns. And this is a whole different hospital. And by the way, I love doctors. I love nurses. I'm in no way bad-mouthing doctors, nurses, or hospitals. I just feel like we need to revamp things to make doctors have what they need, to give them what they need, to give nurses what they need, which is proper nourishment. Because in our time of need, when we are the most vulnerable, these are the people, the rescuers that save us. So I think it's so important to nourish them. When my son was two, he was in the hospital. We spent every day there. We would go to the cafeteria to get food. And underneath the heat lamp are some old French fries and fried chicken fingers. The selection is not very good to, number one, feed patients that need the utmost vitamins and nutrients to get out of there. And number two, the doctors, physicians, nurses, everybody that's working in that hospital we rely on them from the person that is sweeping the floor to the best neurosurgeon. We rely on each and every one of them and we're debt to each and every one of those people. And I feel it's imperative that they get at least given an opportunity to have the best nourishment possible so they can perform at the top of their job. So that is why my wife brought me pureed food. And that is why when my son was in the ICU, we decided to find restaurants that were serving healthy food or go home and prepare food. We took turns. One person would go cook and we brought back food for the whole staff. Now, I don't expect everybody to do that, but we had the ability to do that. And coming from an Italian culture where food is a way that we really celebrate and food and family I would feel awkward if I didn't offer people food. So we brought food in for the whole staff and we fed everybody because I knew that it would be number one, a miracle for my son to get saved out of there. And number two is I wanted to put everything I could towards facilitating the best performance out of those people that serve us, the doctors and the nurses and everybody in between. And so, you know, I think nourishment is a key. And I have actually, my son Rocco did make it out of the ICU. And since that point, I have dedicated for free a certain amount of my time to educating hospitals, if they're willing, to educating doctors, nurses, and just putting information out there on, hey, how can we best feed these people, these key people, to keep them energized, stimulated, and keep them just healthy and at the top of their, I look at them as athletes at the top of their athletic performance when we're in their need of their service. So that's why my wife brought me in food and it helped. And that's why we brought in food for my son when he was in the ICU. Absolutely amazing. And thank you for all that you're doing for the healthcare workers in the hospital and anybody listening. Let's yes, talk sir. About, oh, go, go ahead, well, I was going to I was going to say you mentioned Ziggy Marley. So l let's talk about some of the uh, celebrities that you have worked with to positively impact and change their lives and how you even got into that, because there are a lot of uh, professional trainers, but not too many can say, hey, I work with Ziggy Marley and, and the people that you work with. Oh, th yeah, I love Zig Ziggy. I trained for 20 years. And when when I first met Ziggy, his real name's David. And I had no idea I was meeting Ziggy. His agent in in Los Angeles had called and they asked if I was willing to see their client, David Marley. And so I said, of course. And I set up a, a consultation appointment. And when Ziggy showed up, he introduced himself as Ziggy. And we started talking and I asked him when David was going to show up because I actually had an appointment with David. We headed off laughing and we've been friends ever since. Ziggy has always had a passion for helping, for giving to kids, for fitness, for health. He's a wonderful human being. But he was caught in the world of touring where it's not conducive necessarily to being healthy. You may perform in one city, 
And then you get on a tour bus and you travel at three o'clock in the morning until the next city. And the sleep on a tour bus is not great. I've been on tour for a couple of years and I slept on many, many a tour bus. And I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, it's not the most comfortable experience, but you have to do what you have to do. And so you may be on the road for 100, 200 days, and then you get in different time zones, you get working late, and it's tough to get your workouts in. And if you don't prepare properly your nutrition, you start eating bad things. So I would work with Ziggy initially, and he would get in amazing shape, and we'd get him ready for tour, and then he'd go off on tour and he would come back and Ziggy, I love you to death. And if you hear this, you know, I'm never trying to be offensive, but he would be a train wreck when he would come back. We would lose all our progress. So over the course of time, we sat down and we strategized and we prepared. And I looked at it as if we were going into battle when he went on the road and we prepared what things can we do to bring with you to make it as easy as possible for you to have the proper food. What things can we implement? So exercise is super easy because whether it's Ziggy, I've worked with Shakira, I've worked with some different top level people, professional athletes. I look at even a housewife as an athlete. How do we get the most out of this person, whether they're an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, a housewife? How do we get you at the top of your game energy wise, physically, mentally, spiritually? So we all have different gifts. And how do we get you giving the world your gifts? If How do we do that if you're tired? How do we do that if you're injured? How do we do that if you're not feeling good? How do we do that if you don't want to roll out of bed? It's so tough. So how do we reverse all that and get you good sleep, get you good food, get you good energy, so then you can deliver your gift to the world at optimal rate? So with Ziggy, we started preparing food ahead of time. We started going, okay, we know you're in Chicago this day. You're going to be in Detroit this day, whatever the schedule may be. What can we do in between there? How? What places can we maybe stop and eat? What things can you bring with you on tour? Because I wasn't traveling on this tour with him. That can make exercise easy. Even if it's only 15 minutes, even if it's only 20 minutes, how do we get you to be healthy and active? So when it's your time to perform and the lights are on you, that the people that paid hard money to show up for to come to your concert get the most of your gift. And it took a while, but we crafted all those things. And I can tell you unequivocally with science, not with my guesswork, but through science of taking different tests, body fat, muscle mass, lung capacity, Ziggy Marley at 50 years old is much healthier, much more of an optimal athlete than he was at 30. So in, in 20 years of aging, he is age-wise, he's probably decreased his biological age 20 years. And he's in probably the best shape of his life right now at 50 years old as compared to being at 30 because he took the time, put in the time, put in the effort, got the knowledge and found the key. He unlocked his wellness code. As I like to say, he unlocked the keys that made it easy for him to be successful. So when someone leaves his concert, they're like, man, that was the best concert ever. How did he perform for two and a half, three hours and not stop? You could feel the love and the energy in the air. Well, those things are made possible more consistently by consistently taking care of what you need to take care of, which is your health. And now, Curtis, I just talked an awful lot, man. I'm sorry, I went on a tirade. You got me super excited on this, buddy. No, that is great. Keep super excited for the next question. But real quick, I just want to say, man, I, I hope Ziggy is or would be listening to this podcast. Ziggy, if you are listening, let me know. But anyway, uh, that's one of your proud accomplishments, I can tell. So talk about some of the other proud accomplishments that you've accomplished throughout your career and your life. Sure. So one thing I found about working with celebrities is that we're all human, brother. We're all human. We may put this, you know, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but maybe I had put a lot on what it means to be a celebrity or a professional athlete. And But at the end of the day, we're all human and we all have the same trials and tribulations and we all bleed red. And so the human factor is key. And one of my progress accomplishments is even though I'm not doing a lot of it right now because I'm geared and I'm supposed to be talking, but is to be able to listen. One of my process accomplishments is to be able to be an ear 
for some someone that needs to express what's going on and then being able to take that information and hopefully craft a way forward for them to either get better health, to be more successful, to be happier. Because Curtis, there's key things that we want in life, whether we know it or not. And happiness is definitely one of them. I'm sure you probably get a lot of happiness from doing this podcast. I'm sure you, you have things in your life that bring you joy and happiness. And as a trainer, I understand that if people are ailing, if they have a bad back, if they're fighting a, de- a disease, whether it's an autoimmune disease or cancer, it makes it more challenging. Not impossible because our state of mind is controlled by what we choose, but it makes it more difficult for you to be the light that you need to be in this world if you're dealing with unhealthy situations or ailments. So I think one of my biggest gifts as a trainer is number one, to listen. And sometimes just listening is enough. And when needed, to be able to take the information and craft a path forward that will help the individual that I'm working with make changes in their life that are sustainable and find their through line. So whatever it is they want to be, whatever it is they're passionate about, to be able to give all of that to every other person that comes into their life and is meaningful to them and is in need. So, you know, I know that's not a one specific thing about, okay, it was this person or that person, but I think it's that gift of listening that is the biggest accomplishment that I have. All right. Tell everybody about your book, plus what we can expect when we read it and where the listeners can go find it at. Yeah, of course. So, My book is called Confessions of a Hollywood Trainer. And I say right in the first chapter, the first couple of lines, it's not a book about my secret diet or nutritional plan. It's not a book about, you know, how to get in red carpet shape. It's a book about my journey. It's a book about a young man that went from child, it goes from childhood to now that has a ton of what people may classify Curtis as failures in their life. But I look at them as learning experiences now. If you take and isolate 10 or 15 different things in my life, you might go, man, this guy has failed a lot. What I've learned to do is go, this is a life experience. There are tools and lessons to be learned from this experience. How do I take those tools from this experience, put it in my tool belt? So when another opportunity presents itself, I can use those tools, that new knowledge to make a difference in the world. So my book is about extreme amount of failures from going to jail, getting arrested, for asking for forgiveness for what I've done, to becoming a trainer. Uh, I had a stint in Hollywood where at one point I thought, looking for my father's approval, I thought that I wanted to be an actor. I was on, and and I was successful at it. I was on every soap opera. I was on different TV shows, I acted in different TV shows and movies. And I found it didn't fulfill me. It didn't give me the joy that I got from training. And I actually turned down a contract to be on a mini series and walked away from it because I had so much more joy in helping people and watching them achieve their goals through fitness. It's a story about, I, at one point, I was a Dolce Gabbana model with Giselle, which is a freak of nature because at 19 years old, I was barely six foot and I had acne and my mother used to cut my hair. It's how you can have some of the worst circumstances this book is about and turn them around to be something positive. It's how you can look at the world and go, man, everyone's against me and it's everybody else's fault and have a change of mindset and realize I need to take responsibility for my actions. I need to take responsibility for my own life. I need to get up every day put in the work and take responsibility for these actions and change my life so my book is about all that it takes my journeys from being a kid from being a violent youth to getting arrested to going to hollywood being a trainer to actually getting in acting myself walking away from it to marrying my wife and getting paralyzed and to getting here with you right now on this podcast And from the book, I just want, I don't want to talk about everything that's in there, but I want people to know that literally, literally everything in this world is possible. 
If you dream it, you can do it. Somebody else has done it before you from walking on the moon to being a doctor, to being a podcaster, to being an athlete. Somebody has done it. If you study their patterns, it gives clues. And if you're willing to put in the work, utilize some of those clues, take tools from the mistakes that you think you've made in the past, but are really just gifts. Take tools from your past journey, apply them forward and work your butt off. You can accomplish anything. I mean, let's talk about writing a book. I have dyslexia. I only passed high school because I'm pretty sure some of the teachers were tired of seeing my face because I was a horrible student. And I got the inspiration to write this book when I was laying in the hospital paralyzed. When I realized that I couldn't use my physicality anymore and I had to use my mentality to positively influence people, I got the inspiration to write a book. And we put this book together. I've never written a book. I can hardly read a book. And it became an Amazon number one new release. So anything is possible. And I am happy to help people if you reach out to me to write your book. I'm happy to donate time to doctors, to nurses, to hospital facilities, to our rescuers, our first responders, and and help them whenever I can. Because this is my passion is and what gets me inspired and gets me up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock every morning. Okay, well, let's talk about any upcoming projects or, or current projects that's important to you that you got coming up or ongoing that the listeners need to know about. Absolutely. So I'm going to write a second book. This this book right here, Confessions of a Hollywood Trainer, is out on Amazon right now. There, I'm going to warn everybody that there is some spare words. So the thing I'm doing next, Curtis, is I need to... Um, I need to write a version that is going to be for younger kids so they can hear stories and relate to them. But in writing this book, even though I try not to swear now as much, or I had to be honest. I had to be 100% honest and go, okay, this is how I screwed up. This is probably how I was talking at that time. This was my journey then. And this is how I am now. So we can evolve. Um, I'm uh, working on writing that second book. And right now, I'm just working on promoting this book and promoting the message and going out there and helping as many people as possible by getting in front of groups of kids and uh, and young adults and old adults alike and just going, hey, this is my story and your story is yet to be written, whether that's in pen, whether that's on a keyboard or whether that's just an action. And the world needs people out there living their dreams. The world needs people out there being they're all, being optimal. The world needs people that have other people in mind and want to serve and help because otherwise this world does not go around. Absolutely. Go out your contact information so people can keep up with everything that you're up to. They just want to contact. Yes, Curtis, will do. So you can find me at johnpetrelli.com. On Instagram, I think it's john.petrelli. Also, confessions of a Hollywood trainer.com is my website. And you'll get a little bit more insight in regards to some of the crazy stories in here. And <laughs> just ask, don't judge me of how I used to be. Don't judge me by what happened at Burger King. And if you read the book, you'll see, don't judge me about the crazy things I've done with different celebrities. Judge me about who I am now. I'm always trying to be a better person. So you can find me at Instagram, you can find me at Facebook, you can find me on my own websites. And the book is on Amazon, it's on iTunes, it's on Audible. In the audiobook, there is three hours of extra content that you won't find in the regular book. We did it a little podcast style in between every chapter and added extra info. Curtis, I just want people to take away to go to know that no matter where you are in life, no matter where you are, whatever your bottom is, whether that is at the bottom of being arrested like it was for me, whether it's at the bottom of a bottle, whether it's you just got a divorce, whether you lost your job, there is a way up. If you're willing to work, surround yourself with positive people, surround yourself with positive knowledge, and be, be gracious to yourself and kind to yourself as you would other people, and know that there is a tomorrow and there is a way of you changing your entire life. Absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, and anything's possible. You can find him at johnpetrelli.com. Be sure to check out his book. Check out everything that he's going to be up to and all of the great things that he's doing to help the world become a better place. Please be sure to follow, rate, review, 
share this show and episode to as many people as possible. If you have any suggestions or guest topics, please be sure to email them to cjackson102 at cox.net. Please be sure to tell a friend about the show. And if you know Ziggy, tell him to check out the show that I had his personal trainer on. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll tell Ziggy. How about that, Curtis? Is that, is that good enough? Do it. Do it. Yeah, of course. Well, John, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, my brother. Listen, continue success on your journey, helping people out there. I so appreciate you having me on. And uh, I thank you so much, buddy. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.